SWAT 4 takes place in Fairview, a fictional doppelganger of the New York City. The first mission opens up with a fade-in of a restaurant. It is immediately clear where you are. A spray of sparks bursts from the tracks as a train passes above you. A street, an elevated railway, a Chinese restaurant. By this point, a Chinese restaurant is as American as cowboys. Bright yellow panels with red letters and bleaching white of the neon tubes individually announce the shared origin of their aesthetic. In six missions there's this particular act of entering from the outside into the interior where the action is taking place. Courtyards, backyards, back entrances, alleys, a street. Through these you are given a glimpse of a living city. Sometimes you're near its center, sometimes on its outskirts. This illusion is withheld through passing cars and trains, parked vehicles in front of apartment buildings, lights turned on inside flats, police cars at the scene of the crime, onlookers at its perimeter. You are aware of a city out there without ever properly seeing it. Outside of the quick convenience store, there's a docking area with a warehouse to the left and a diner in front. Nothing betrays the sense of a highway stop at the city's edge. Robber's van is parked outside. Next to it is a patrol car that responded to the initial 911 call. Building in front of the Diamond Center looks different from the ones around the A-Bomb Club, implying a more affluent part of town through its architecture. In a broader sense, Fairview is a part of that family of city noir trope settings we see in Max Payne and GTA 4, one where criminals for the most part look and talk like the rest of the citizens, where victims of crime are clerks, students, IT assistants, nurses, working class people in general. Where crime happens next to apartment buildings, near public transportation, in calm neighborhoods, behind doors and windows people walk by every day. Sounds of the city play an important role in maintaining the illusion of its existence out there beyond the fence. The sound of the car horn passing by at a high speed. Trains rushing between buildings. Distant sirens. Dogs barking. Birds and crickets chirping. Wind howling. There's no reason for you not to believe that this is a real city with a real America out there. We experience this city through its interiors as much as we do through the glimpses of its surface. This is because every large city has an auto repair shop, a software company, a hospital, a suburban area. They are what the city is made of, the insides of a city. Some of these environments have such a believable design and authentic atmosphere that they could be cut down the middle and presented as dioramas. There are two types of location, scenes of crime and places of crime. Sometimes the suspects are the intruders, sometimes they own the place. In the first one, violence is brought into it deliberately or through circumstance. In the second, crime is hiding behind an impression of normalcy. A suburban home with a particular basement, a restaurant with an illegal activity upstairs, a playhouse and a laundromat being fronts for illegal gambling. Space is either disrupted by a sudden onset of violence or it hides criminal activity. The football restaurant in particular has this sense that you're not even supposed to be there. It looks like a normal restaurant wow, with patrons and employees like until you climb the stairs. Depending on the type, the interior has to either encapsulate its own utility or reflect the personality of its owner. In the offices behind the stage in the A-Bomb Club, there's a day's turnover counted out on the desk. Behind the restaurant, there's a storage room where meat is packed in freezers. Auto Center has an arcade room for customers to pass time while waiting. Renovators at the old granite hotel have taken a lunch break amidst the clutter. Below the ground level at the hospital there's a morgue, all with a refrigerator unit, body trays and the mortuary washing table, and a sly JFK assassination reference. Icicles are formed in a cryogenic swamp. Details really make this experience what it is, and sometimes they go to the point where there are holes in the wall next to a dartboard. Environmental design of SWAT 4 goes beyond mere visual fidelity. Its environments have layers. They have a unique identity, implied history and human psychology. Red Library Software Company is a great example. Geometry of the place makes sense. Parking space below, cubicles overlooked by management in the middle, CEO offices on top. They have an office kitchen, meeting room, recreational space, bathrooms, storage room. Relaxing music plays at the entrance. There's a wheelchair access, an info desk. The company has a distinct identity, a modern logo that's present throughout the office. 
posters have these original slogans that seem like a real marketing campaign. Some of them capture layman's anxiety about IT stuff quite faithfully. Briefing mentions that they are specialized in data storage. Fittingly, you find a bunch of old cases having their hard disks ripped for data extraction. That's someone's family photos right there. They are in the process of changing the old CRT monitors with new LCD ones for the employees. Not all monitors are on since not every employee was working that Saturday. CEO appears to cycle to work. There you go, an environment with its own identity, its history prior to your entry, and human psychology. Psychology that forgets to close the scanner glass and scribbles down notes. All the levels share these design principles. More modern offices have more modern telephones. The same goes for types of TVs. Clubs, offices, homes, they all have bathrooms and they all match the core aesthetic of the space. Just look at this contrast. As soon as you step in, there's already a history there. By creating individual histories for their levels, developers disarm any doubt and immerse the player into the world and by proxy into the action that it demands and stories that arise out of it. The A-Bomb Club is another interior that has an authentic identity. In accordance with its name, bomber motifs decorate its walls. Graffiti isn't vandalism here. Still, there's an obvious difference between professionally done stencils and bursts of inspiration from patrons. There's a lot of stickers and posters promoting bands and concerts and they faithfully capture that alternative in the aesthetic. Naturally, a payphone has a bunch of ads on it. In the offices, they have a menu for ordering in and have ordered food from the food wall before. They have a bunch of CDs for making bootlegs of the performances. New bottles ready next to the water cooler. They were in the middle of unloading the equipment for the concert just before the shootout. St. Michael's Hospital Center has posters promoting health and showing human development. Photographs of esteemed doctors. A waiting room with magazines and tissues. Ventilator rhythmically imitates the lungs. There is a medical records room where individual files are kept urinary tract infections, colds, cuts, herniated discs, a whole medical history of the county. This blandness of a hospital is just realistic and there is no particular merit in its design. Its visual identity is based in mundanity of protocol. You can't design a hospital the way you decorate a nightclub. But it all works brilliantly when contrasted against a children's ward. Walls are decorated with images of animals. Nurses working here wear a different scrub. Around the room there are colorful get well cards and balloons. A birthday celebration was interrupted. This creates rather disturbing implications, quite effectively. When Detective Walsh marveled at the size of the setup of the illegal gambling operation, he wasn't exaggerating. The whole place is under camera surveillance. There's a bar for customers to relax while waiting for the results and there are VIP sections for additional privacy. Scores are being tracked on boards. There's a coal furnace as the main source of heating. I guess they don't want to receive the bill for an illegal operation and keep the heating system separate. Look at the ceiling. It's just stacks of glass wool protruding between boards. Cashier and counting room are merged and locked behind a mesh fence. A large payout of Andrew Jackson's is counted out with electronic bill counters. Too much cash to be counted manually. Floors are littered with cigarette butts and torn tickets. There's an operational safe and a larger one for more permanent storing. From there, a door leads into boss's room from where he oversees the whole place. A more private game is being hosted inside a laundromat for business partners. Large duffel bag on the floor is, I presume, the week's takeout. Laundromat appears to have been on sale sometimes in the past. It was probably bought by these guys who then set up the whole operation, keeping the amusements manager on the take instead of buying his place as well. Note that both fronts aren't really used as their entrances are cluttered with stuff. Laundromat's windows are covered with newspapers. But these environments don't just tell self-contained stories about Fairview's music scene or corporate culture. Walcott projects have broader implications. The whole place is dilapidated and in the process of being demolished. Scaffoldings and waste chutes are already set up. There's a giant hole in the wall. Basement is flooded and an entire corner of the building has crumbled down. Naturally, the blueprint reflecting the original state of the building is inaccurate. Door frames are now cluttered with furniture and new openings are made inside of walls. On one of the unhinged doors there's a graffiti saying Apocalypse 04. A large sign promotes community and commitment to a bunch of rubble. Upstairs you find a charcoal room, burnt wood crunches under your footsteps. One of the main criticism of many of these housing projects was that they were neither well made in the first place nor sufficiently budgeted for maintenance. So we are left in the dark with regards to the cause of the fire. Whether it was negligence or faulty installation, it is one of the possible explanations for its abandonment. 
There was quite a number of such projects ultimately demolished by local authorities, most infamously the Pruitt Igo apartments. SWAT 4 doesn't capture just Walcott's failure, but its hopelessness. Most shooters, including tactical shooters, have environments that simply provide a space for action, generic and forgettable, without story in themselves. In SWAT 4, there is an inherent narrative to the space of each mission and, what's more, an authentic psychology to it. SWAT 4 tells its stories in two ways, through its environments and through its suspects. Missions are self-contained, but there is an overarching story, the one about a city and, by proxy, a wider society. Levels share the same implications of realism. Same pop culture, superheroes, blockbusters, arcade games, same products and ads, batteries that last longer and cigars that make a man. In the corner of the convenience store, there's a box of leaflets about Andrew Tyrone's teachings. Newspapers about the disappearances of female students from campus grounds can be found throughout the levels. And Deb appears to have shattered someone's ego into thousands of pieces. It's clear that this is a single world, one that shares the sky. This establishes a framework for narrative and themes of every mission. This shouldn't be happening here. I thought this was a safe town. These stories are deeply rooted into the environment, and you explore them organically as you peel off the fabric from the edges of what was a modern American society at the time. Most of the props and layouts are contextualized in the mundanity of their roles. But then there's something that represents the chaos that was brought to that space. A doctor in a pool of blood next to a fallen monitor. What an introduction to chaos. They were blasting away as soon as they walked in. A guy caught in the fire was carrying flowers to someone. These are definitive testaments that something is wrong within this space. They stick out so viciously out of its normalcy. Throughout the levels you find traces of criminal activity or objects of their motivation. Small work workshop where Neil modifies magazines. Walls of his bedroom are decorated with posters from a fictional magazine called Cool Guns. On them are badass women posing with pistols. He doesn't just sell illegal gun modifications, he's a gun nut across the whole spectrum. In the garage you find a car that was being jacked, its door open, alarm still sounding off, and a crowbar on the floor. In the office of the convenience store you find one of the most complete scenes of crime. A knockdown lamp, a flashlight, a set of tools, a Duffel bag next to a cracked safe and some loose cash. Briefing notes that the shootout was between a white and a Hispanic gang, and the skin color of the models checks out. Even though they've crashed into the building while trying to await cops, robbers still attempt to force Red Library CEO to open the safe in his office. Detective Walsh is beaten up and bruised when you find him, which confirms that they've discovered the wire on his body. You find cases with smuggled AKs in the abandoned building. This gives an actual origin to a particular crime. In the server room of the Red Library, there's a fallen panel of one of the cubicles. On top of it lies a wounded employee. He makes genuine effort to get up, but a gunshot wound prevents him. Animation is truthful to the pain and effort. The rest of the cubicles stand undisrupted in stark contrast. The one that's fallen is soaked in blood already. From the perspective of the player, which is that of an intruder onto chaos, this is a small story. A story of how a suspect was either surprised by this person or met resistance and shot them in a way that had them falling against the panel and knocking it over. One of the elevator doors are closed. No story there. The others are closing on the head of one of the employees, relentless in their mechanical idiocy. Poor guy probably startled one of the robbers with an itchy trigger finger when the doors opened and they just left him there. And how to end the game if not with questions of life itself. Hallways of the Mount Threshold Research Center are decorated with posters and slogans celebrating scientific progress. New age is proclaimed over images of chemical symbols, molecules and fetuses. They could be used in a real-life facility with the same purpose. One poster is provocative in particular. Prayers answered. Both words are bent in relation to the worldview of those involved. Army of Fate has stormed the building, ready to take life. Life which the scientists are claiming to be improving while answering people's prayers to the god that the Army of Fate claims to be serving through the act of violence they're doing. This is why I have continuous appreciation for SWAT 4, because it always finds ways to insert motive and psychology in the most minuscule of its details. It connects its environment to violence and crime that take place within it, instead of leaving it a mere stage for them. In a broader sense, SWAT 4 helps complete the picture of how Irrational went from Med Psy to Fairview and further to Rapture and Columbia, and how their environments always tell stories and reflect psychology. 
Spot 4 creates a world with post-its on monitor edges, cut birthday cakes and cockroaches, but its themes are ultimately explored through its depiction of criminality. Even though it doesn't have a traditional story, there is thematic consistency with the narrative bits offered through motivations for crime. The game explores the culmination of specific societal issues, unweaving individual threads from the tapestry of criminality of a metropolitan area. Doing that, it naturally explores parts of the fabric of the American society itself, and that is the connective tissue across the career. Every mission brings its own micro-narrative and theme. The ever-present gun debate, societal fascination with the phenomenon of serial killers, armed robbery as a way to get drug money, gang violence along racial lines, Grand Theft Auto, bank robbery that resulted in a hostage situation because a software company office is open on a Saturday, a violence that spills over, illegal betting, a robbery that juxtaposes two greeds, the complex relationship between fringe groups, freedom and a messiah complex, an international incident hinting at the US involvement in managing conflicts overseas, the Korean War in particular, which was a result of the Cold War, but then when the Cold War enemy does fall apart, its guns come to the USA through international gun trade routes to kill its citizens and fire at its SWAT teams. Isolationism and anti-immigration militia groups and an ideological clash between a specific branch of science and a particular understanding of religion. All of these momentary pinnacles of violence can be traced down to continuous debates within the American public about race, religion, scientific progress, firearms, freedom, life itself, and their roots run deep into the individual sense of self as well as collective identities. In order to create drama that warrants a violent response, SWAT 4 naturally naturally pushes these issues to the extreme side of the spectrum. You don't just face people expressing their opinions but violently acting upon them. While most crimes are given a believable motive, the sociology and pathology of it are merely hinted at. Ideology or religious beliefs are enough to explain why somebody is standing there with a gun, but it hardly explains how they came to be a part of it in the first place. That would have been great, but a lot to ask for at the same time. During Clinton's administration, a law was passed in 94 that, among other things, banned the use of high-capacity magazines. Neo is using his skill to fill out the vacuum on the market and capitalize on the opportunity to sell modifications at higher prices. Just because a government decides to ban something doesn't mean people will stop trying to get it. A practice true for many goods and services, including gambling. Ever since London Fog gave birth to Jack the Ripper, we had a societal fascination with the phenomenon of serial killers who develop personal mythologies through their MOs. According to the CDC, opioid epidemic in the US has been going on since late 90s. The fact that Alice Jenkins has put together a sloppy robbery in order to pay for her addiction implies one such crisis in the city. I find the briefing section about it rather humanizing. So far we have one likely ID, Alice Jenkins. She's been in rehab for oxycodone addiction. Oxycodone is an opiate similar to heroin, equally addictive. It's prescribed legally as a Schedule II drug making it possible for any idiot with a falsely obtained prescription to turn dealer. It sells for up to $80 a pop on the street. She might have had it prescribed to ease the pain of a herniated disc. That her victims are store clerks is an inevitable tragedy of an urban setting, but this just goes to show how its depiction of crime cuts close to the bone. Look, I don't care about the money. Just quit your whining! SWAT 4 creates a spectrum of criminality, from suspects in jeans and sneakers to armored militia. Guys in charge of the bookmaking operation wear suits, which goes to show that even crime has a dress code. Social strata is also represented, as crime affects clerks, homeless people, executive alike. That moment you realize that an employee is part of a criminal activity is so subversive. It exploits the concept of appearance the same way hitman games do. A gardener must be a gardener, otherwise nothing is for sure. If you start questioning the attire of each person you come across, the world will become hell. You encounter this in the first mission. One of the cooks is in on it. But in the diamond store robbery, this is part of the whole scheme. It's mentioned during the briefing as a possibility and one of the employees voices his suspicion. They really knew what they were doing. Came in here like a ton of bricks. I've never been so scared in my life. They needed an insider to pull it off and indeed you find two suspects in suits. Just as you got used to suspects not looking like civilians, there's those two guys. During the auto repair robbery, a guy from sanitation pulls a gun on you. 
with no explanation. In most of the missions you have what for the purpose of this analysis has to be called ordinary criminals. People who wear the same faces as civilians. They rob, kill, make and sell illegal stuff. Their motivation is clear, understandable even. These are ordinary people. They wake up in the morning and put a wristwatch on, wear prescription glasses, have tattoos. Progressively you face better organized and more determined suspects that increasingly resemble the element. Then there's a group with questionable mental health and radical states of psyche. This is where the game is disturbingly implicative. It suggests a lot with strange symbols and creepy masks, but refuses any objective explanation. The last category are groups with ideological platforms. America Now is an isolationist and anti-immigration group and they bring that old dogma of land and blood that has shed so much of it across many lands. The original hotel ownership had financial trouble and it was bought out of bankruptcy by a French company. America Now stresses the importance of the domestic ownership of the land and property and they have calculated a debt to the American people somewhere in that transaction. Being against foreigners, free trade and foreign capital, they demand the debt settled at the threat of life of the company's heir. Army of Fate is a domestic terrorist group known for bombing facilities reaching stem cells and cloning technology. The group is based on an active Christian terrorist network called Army of God, known for its anti-abortion violence throughout the United States. In case of the Children of Tyrone, the second second and third category interweave and this is where there are the most psychological layers and variation present. Their lines during confrontations or while being cuffed are bizarre and reveal a system of indoctrination based on who knows what. Fear, delusions, exploitation of mental illness. But there's no doubt that they consider this man to be what he says he is. It's scary at moments. It's as if the game comes alive when they begin to inform you as to just how much they believe in whatever it is that they believe. My hands are empty but I will fight. With America Now and Army of Faith, things are pretty clear. They are based on a wide selection of real-life militia groups that fall under umbrella terms such as patriot movements, sovereign citizens, or simply American militia. Their ideologies range from serpent seed doctrines to neo-fascism with survivalism, anti-government, conspiracy theories, and your vanilla garden variety white supremacy with less mythology in between. Children of Tyrone are a combination of several real-life cults. People's Temple, Heaven's Gate, and Branch Davidians. This prominent usage of a cult and fringe groups, both militant, is particularly interesting. It's a long-standing stereotype for a reason. There is just something about American identity and freedom. Of course, it's not exclusive and there are all sorts of freedoms across the world, but ever since the colonies, there was an inherent connection between that complex moniker American, the land itself, and freedom with a capital F. Perhaps more like a cult of freedom, with everything good or bad that comes with it. I think that a direct line of reasoning can be traced from pilgrims escaping persecution for religious beliefs in Europe to militias and cults. It is only a radical implementation of that identity, one that places its rights over others. It's freedom that interprets itself as worthy of encroaching upon other freedoms. Freedom degenerated into isolationism and militantism. A lot of such phenomena simply aren't possible outside of the US. Militant groups are a result of various freedoms, most prominently the freedom to possess firearms. That's why you have to go in there and meet their violence with your own. People all over the world have a messiah complex, but Tyrone has guns to put behind his. People have a whole spectrum of thought about cloning and stem cell research at least in simplistic terms, but they just don't have the means to oppose them outside of voting or holding a protest sign. Army of Fate does. SWAT 4 squeezes a lot of social commentary in its missions, about freedom and governance and motivations for crime, but it doesn't offer any conclusions except that it's all often paid for in lives. Motivation behind criminality and psychology of space are a meeting point of storytelling. In three missions in particular, this is crafted masterfully. Fairfax residence provides an intimate insight into a bizarre phenomenon, without the barrier of a news report or overly artistic depiction of a movie. The briefing is realistic and immersive, but it doesn't prepare you for what you're in for. It does set up a very convincing framework though. A series of murders are placed in context. A profile of victims is given. One of them fought her killer and police were able to get a DNA match of skin scrapings underneath her nails. To make things more complicated, another student went missing recently and judging by his MO she might still be alive. 
Suspect is a quiet guy, currently works as a carpenter at the university where victims were studying. There is nothing out of the ordinary as you look at the back entrance porch of the Fairfax residence. You hear birds and crickets instead of incoming traffic or rushing trains. Traveling from a city to a suburban area was always an aesthetic experience for me. All the peculiarities of suburbia begin to emerge. Things get quieter, space becomes more intimate. There's not a tall building in sight. You can almost imagine families in their mundanity around the neighborhood. Seems like a good morning can I borrow this tool kind of place where everyone knows each other and everyone takes care of everyone's kids. Truth is that out there in the nature we are exposed to many dangers, but inside a city we are trapped with each other. It is a cage for all of human phenomena. It's early morning and the dawn is yet to pale into whiteness. As soon as you step in, layers of stories merge and dissolve into each other. A place with an utter disregard for hygiene, with elements of hoarding. Trash is ready to be taken out, but nobody has done it in a long time. Cockroaches have cleared claim the place as their own. Dishes are piled up in the sink. One of the officers comments on the smell. Main source of calories are ready meals. Gladys has health issues and has to use a walker and a toilet chair occasionally. There's also an old wheelchair in the corner. There's a bunch of her pills in the bathroom. She's a compulsive smoker. She still has a friend who wishes her well. Her unique posture confirms both her age and her health problems. Crossing the doorstep is the queue and the soundtrack is chilling. It's as if the sound pours out of the misery of the place. As you enter the living room, you hear TV static over a flickering screen and then out of nowhere a radio broadcast cuts in with a message from Melinda's mother. It sounds horrifying. The pauses, stuttering, crying and the final breakdown. It all sounds so realistic. The choice of words, how she begins with, I would just like to say, because who can have a script for something like that? If you can hear me, honey, because she's already aware on some level that this message might never reach her daughter, to whoever it took her, because she has no idea who it might be. There is no obvious motif to why her daughter was chosen. This is not something a family can rationalize, process. She says, I beg you, then stops, wishing to amplify it, and then whimpers out, please. The house is rustic, there are cracks in the walls, furniture, half curtains, wooden shutters, floorboards. Everything seems so old. There's a distinct line of mold on the wallpaper. In a few spots it had peeled off to reveal old boards underneath. Bathroom faucet is dripping. Something's wrong with the heating system, there's a knocking sound coming from the radiator. It is a home that implies all kinds of misery. But under this decay, there's a memory of happier times. A growth chart recorded Lawrence's height as a child. He appears to have lagged behind the average but had caught up by the age of 19. At a point in time in the past, this is where this old lady was drawing these lines at the top of her son's head. She sleeps in a large double bed but no mention of a father figure is ever made. Lawrence's room remains as it was when he was a kid, with race car motifs and something of a den-like fortress, with disturbed drawings inside. A childhood is trapped within those walls. The room is now used as a storage for old newspapers. Two motifs are present throughout the first floor. The place appears to be near an ocean. As soon as you open the door, a painting of a wooded coastal region welcomes you in. There is one imitating a porthole window looking out on a lighthouse. A real helm hangs on a wall. Above a dead fireplace, there is a painting of a gloomy old sailor with a shipwreck against the rocks behind him. Below the painting is a statue of one in the iconic yellow raincoat. Perhaps Fairfax's were a family of sailors. Throughout the floor you find religious imagery. There are two statues of Mother Mary behind the couch. Gladys has a crucifix next to her bed and a painting of the Good Shepherd. She keeps a replica of the two stone tablets of the Decalogue on the side of her closet. What possible role his mother's religious beliefs could have had on his becoming or on her denial remains unexplained. This is a space with history that goes far beyond that moment. Its horror and its misery were in the making decades before you have stepped into that kitchen. While these policemen were living their lives, this horror was being incubated within the rotten walls of a suburban home, the likes of many you drive by perhaps every day. In the garage you find a white van, that's how he transports his victim back to the house, a nod to the silence of the lamps. Rats in cages have died from negligence, which means Lawrence was busy doing something else. There's a discarded bench press in the corner. His physique confirms it has been for a while. This is where I usually find him. Bold and hairless, he looks like a giant infant. Like most serial killers, he takes pride in his work and has a wall of vanity in form of newspaper headlines and clippings about his crimes. 
has a setup for his viewing pleasure right next to his bed. Rows of VHS cases imply he has hours of footage. He doesn't use his old room at all and lives exclusively in the basement. His wanted sketch is reimagined as a Unabomber reference. There's always a problem of how to end something, how to untangle the suspense and mystery. From this room you enter into another one with a fabric cover in the middle. It is precisely designed so that coming behind the edge of that curtain you are incrementally revealed the scene behind it, as visuals slide up the scale of disturbing. Reflector lights spill over and are channeled through the eye hollows in the masks until your eyes are on the victim writing on a soiled mattress. Here we discover the reason for hoarding all those newspapers. He's making papier-mâché casts of his victims with newspaper pulp. He even has a bucket full of it prepared for his current two victims. If judged by the number of old newspapers he's stockpiled, he isn't about to stop anytime soon. I guess when he completes his mold, he has no further use of his victims. Glue is spilled on the floor. The unidentified victim has a partial mold on her face. He already began the process with her. The mask with the makeup could be a previous victim or perhaps a rendition of Gladys from a decade ago. But that's a false scent. You still haven't found Melinda Klein, nor her body. From that room, a large rusty door leads into a dirt tunnel. It's primitive and covered by sheets of tin and plywood. At the end of it is a chamber made out of rusty sheet metal. That's where you find Melinda next to a finished mold. Around the chamber there are scraps of food, he was keeping them alive until the end of the process. The fact that many players were disturbed to the point of going back and shooting handcuffed Lawrence out of sheer intensity of whatever emotion they felt is a testament to how subtly and masterfully this mission manipulates your emotions. SWAT 4 creates an implication of a terrified community. A home that implies a disturbed psyche and a killer with an enigmatic personal mythology. You can interpret further, of course, but there's no shallow psychology or sensationalist manifestos in form of notes or one-liners. You just find implications and consequences. Every attempt to piece back together Lawrence's mind into the framework of logic is ultimately futile. He is deliberately left as an enigma. In my mind, Fairfax Resident stands out amongst a plethora of serial killer depictions. He doesn't get to give any speeches, he isn't portrayed as a genius. Watching both seasons of The Mind Hunter and just reading about some of the killers, I got a completely different understanding of the phenomenon compared to the most of fictional depictions. More often than not, their origin story is a case of personal tragedy, nothing sensational about it. The mission is designed as a descent into the twisted reality of a mental illness and its fantasy. The house itself is designed as layers of Lawrence's personal mythology, from the first floor that housed the larva of his childhood, to the basement of his hatched impulse, to the deepest chamber of his mind that is the cave under his house. As you enter the Duplessis Wholesale Diamond Center, the metal detector inexorably goes off five times as each of the officers walks through, bringing their own metallic violence inside. These were the types of robbers you've faced so far. They looked so civilian. Their connection to the place of the crime wasn't particularly strong. They've attempted to boost a car and rob a store safe. Any space that has those would have been okay. But why did these well-armed, well-equipped guys drove into the front door of this place? The look of it is an immediate giveaway. They are not here for some loose cash. Inside there are ads where in the center of the loves me, loves me not game an affirmative stands out in bold. Instead of Daisy's last petal, a diamond ring is the judge of the truth here. The value parts of society ascribe to this gemstone as a form of expressing emotion or a personal ornament is why these guys are here. But other than the space giving a more obvious motivation for a higher profile robbery and explaining a better organization behind it, there's something else here. Throughout the executive offices you find a bunch of memorabilia from hunting trips in Africa, long antique muskets, antelope horns, elephant foot umbrella stands, maps of South Africa showing British claim in 1885. There's one standing safe, visible and one hidden behind a painting, because there's always more to hide. The whole space is brimming with signs of violence, walls ridden with bullets, blood pools, overturned furniture, opened safes. Papers and bonds scattered all over the place. They were searching for that last shipment of finished jewels and using violence to get the information. On two desks there's an ashtray in the form of a human hand. It's quite appropriate for these big shots to bestow the ash of their cigars into an opened human pole. One of the managers is in the vault. As I come close I hear him say to the suspects, there want. must be a better way. They found where those cut gems were kept. 
Once we cuff him, he says, you gotta stop them, nobody will trust our vaults after this. I guess that's the guy who had all those hunting trips with business partners. Perhaps he was in the middle of giving out that confidential presentation to his team about how they can't send kids into mines because local authorities started enforcing an international law. That presentation slide is deliberately juxtaposed against the more immediate traces of violence. But it doesn't just take a jab at corporate exploitation. It faces off the same human greed in two aesthetic variants. One in suits, the other in Kevlar. How very much I've loved you. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life. As with the Fairfax residents, the briefing does a good job of setting up the scene here. One of the runaway cultists had tipped off the police from a payphone about the Tyronians' plans to commit mass suicide by blowing themselves up. The info checks out and you are going in. They only leave the building in groups of three or more. The leader himself never goes out. And you're told to pay attention to their children within the premises. By the time you knock on that door, there's already a whole history of paranoia behind it. As is the case with the Fairfax family home, the space is completely claimed by its inhabitants. You find traces of who these people are at every corner. In Fairfax house, there was at least a trace of normalcy. Here, even everyday objects either manifest or are a consequence of their belief. One thing that has always bothered me about this level is that your starting point is so exposed. Those two glass panels give direct view to that gloomy hallway. All this expectation Opening is built clear. up through the briefing and then you're not given a proper border to cross between yours and their world. I guess that's the point. A few meters from that door there's a sidewalk with cars parked on the side of the road. Most of the lights around the block are on as people rest after work. Indeed, sometimes as I'm taking out the multi-tool, guys behind me start to shout for a cultist to drop their gun. To the right you find a dining room. It's a communal space that highlights the nature of their connection. You find food rations, cutlery, a lot of plates. In such an intimate environment, these objects are more than mere props. They reveal their psychology. Like people in barracks and schools, they perform the daily ritual of consuming sustenance together as one big family. Naturally, they stockpile food in order to go out as less as possible. In the same way, they share their sleeping space. They have extra mattresses as some of them have to sleep on the floor. All personal possessions fit into a few closets and chests. You can almost imagine a typical day of such a lifestyle. Throughout the whole building, they have utilized almost every bit of space for the production and storage of explosives. Kitchen sink communal spaces, hallways. Behind the building you find a truck they used to bring in all that fertilizer. They did it from the back alley, not through the front doors. Most of the windows are covered. It's a good thing that person decided to report their plan, as they have dedicated a whole room to the production of explosives and are obviously in a rush to get it done. Upstairs in one of the rooms, officer comments, This is a map of the city. What the hell? Perhaps they had other ambitions as well. Just to marvel once again at the attention to detail. They are using a spent product bucket for scooping up matter out of a larger one. Everyone does this if they don't have a real scoop. But in some buckets you also find jugs cut in half for the same purpose. Another common solution in the absence of the real thing. Bear in mind that this is a tenement building. That's why there's so many bathrooms and kitchens around as those are different apartments. And they have different wallpaper because past hosts chose different designs for themselves. They don't need this many bathrooms and have repurposed them. One of the bathrooms is in the process of being torn down in order to get more space. That's how various living rooms and bedrooms became a dining area, armory, lab, storage and sleep sleeping quarters. Also, flashbangs and stingers can activate explosives. Cuffing some of them, you get a feel that they see you as a Roman legionary persecuting their prophet. The cult split off from a core separatist group in Idaho. Imagine how out there these guys are if the original group was too vanilla for them. Splintering within fringe groups isn't uncommon. For example, Branch Davidians were a splinter group of the Shepherd's Rod, which in turn was an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Andrew Tyrone is the leader of this branch, but that book who many copies you find around was authored by another person, certain Dr. Theodore Drozovsky, perhaps the leader of the Idaho Corps. Tyrone is probably an interpreter, not the originator of their beliefs. And here we are left with an even greater enigma than at the bottom of the Fairfax house. What's the point of all of this? Why can't they watch sports or go to a concert? However cryptic and suggestive their beliefs are deliberately portrayed as, you can extract several conclusions from them. They are not exactly a doomsday cult. 
but there are elements of apocalypticism. That they are expecting a day of reckoning is revealed through this writing. We wait as his children in the darkness choking soil and filth until he raises us to breed. They are suffering the existence, awaiting the coming of the Messiah who promised to take them to heaven. Sometimes when they surrender they proclaim This is the darkness Tyrone spoke of. This shows that they were expecting something and perhaps that's why they are in a hurry to die. Words farewell written all over the place complete the picture. Perhaps they want to get ahead of the apocalypse. They are saying goodbye to this plane of existence. You have literally entered the place at the last stage of their journey. To backtrack a bit, unlearn means that their belief requires them to give up the old ways and accept a new lifestyle. One where self is the lowest form. This is a common theme of such groups in highly individualistic societies. That people should silence the ego and change the paradigm completely. That they had succeeded in this is witnessed by graffiti stating I am transformed and the whale has been lifted. This reveals development within those walls. They went from unlearned to transformed to farewell. A complete journey told through the writings on the wall. Another history that was in the making outside of your existence. They refer to a canonical text, perhaps that book by Dr. Drozovsky. A deity or a divine figure is evoked through their writings. He has hidden his face amid a crowd of stars. Zodiac sign is probably just an easter egg. Originally, I wasn't able to track the origin of their symbol until I realized that it actually represents the anatomy of a mushroom cloud. The smallest circle is the point of the explosion, the line leads through the stem into the cloud, and then there's an exit sign to the right, symbolizing their wish to leave. Pretty much all elements of their belief are manifested through their environment and their comments, except one, which I'll leave for the end of the chapter. The most interesting section of the building for me is the improvised church. It's made out of a nave and a pulpit, with a projector screen behind. Rather minimalist. It reveals the nature of the cult better than any other part of the level. Even within the mainstream Christianity, there's this particular variation of simple, crudely built churches without decoration or images. And house churches existed since early Christianity, while Romans were yet pagan and because of their persecution. But this has to be properly contextualized, because however radical the cult is, the history of churches in the US is a history of division. They first came with the European pilgrims, but African Americans had to build their own, and later Irish and Italian immigrants as well. For humans it seems that division is a paradigm, even under the same god. The reason they have their church in what perhaps used to be a bedroom isn't that there aren't any churches around, it's that they don't want to go there because they believe that that's where falsehoods are preached. They've nailed the atmosphere of an isolated community, gathered around an unconventional belief. We'll They'll you. gladly suffer for isolation from the society as long as they get to practice their specific interpretation of a belief. And it's both sad and admirable. The ceiling in the children's room is decorated with glow-in-the-dark stickers shaped as stars. There are toys in the cribs, but there's no children. So far there hasn't been a child model in any of the missions. How are they going to include them when accidentally shooting a civilian is a possibility? A trail of stars leads into the basement where a loud furnace burns bright and dripping water echoes throughout. In a corner there's a small graveyard with child-sized graves. They had to break the concrete to get to the earth. There's a pew in front for the parents. Instead of headstones there are small signs with personal messages from parents or scripture quotes. That their beliefs include an afterlife and a reward for earthly suffering is seen here, and there shall be hands to greet you and chariots to bear you away. It includes reuniting with friends. One of the suspects proclaims, my last breath shall be my first. This sounds as if they believe that they'll be instantly resurrected into the afterlife in the moment of their death. This completes the picture, fits the last puzzle piece in. In case they failed, they wanted to make sure their children are with the one who has hidden his face amid the crowd of stars. It's one of the most chilling moments in video game history. The most prominent case of mass suicide was that of the People's Temple in Jonestown. FBI had recovered from the site what is known as the death tape, which contains Jim Jones's rationalization as to why the group should commit suicide, and one of the members opposes him, suggesting they escape to the Soviet Union. Most members, however, support their leader in his decision. When put into proper context, this mission remains disturbing, but is added a dose of sadness. They give us a code. You can check on there and see if it's on the code. You can check with Russia to see if they'll take us in immediately, otherwise we die. I don't know what else you say to these people. But to me, death is not and death is not a fearful thing. It's living this treachery.
Besides environmental storytelling, each level has a distinct and fitting atmosphere. In front of the Fairfax home, you'll find a carved pumpkin on the porch, and leaves are already brown and crunching underfoot. It's a couple of days before Halloween. Behind the A-Bomb Club, snowflakes are falling, and there are patches of packed snow in corners. By February 24th, there's still snow, but a raining season has started, and it will last until 2nd of April, by the time you raid Tyrone's tenement building. Weather, although useless mechanically, is a factor of the game's atmosphere and it follows you in accordance with the seasons. In most instances, weather is irrelevant once you enter the premises due to the nature of the space, such as the A-Bomb Club which has barely any windows looking outside. But during the raid on the Children of Tyrone, rain is an important and ever-present factor and you hear it almost constantly throughout the mission, threatening to drench the city into a flood, entirely true to the prophetic motifs of the mission. It even drips from the ceiling into a bucket inside a crib. That's how heavy it pours, and that's how rotten the flooring in the building is. If you shatter the window glass, the rain starts to pour inside. Red library offices are well lit with a sun that's still hours ahead of nightfall. Slanted roof with window panes lets in radiating sun rays that imply a day you'd rather spend outside. Quite appropriately, it's Saturday and the sunlight itself is enough of a commentary on the corporate culture. I find weather to be as important in linear games as much as in open world ones. It replicates an aspect of reality that further immerses you into the game and its world while exploiting a human connection to weather that's very old and tightly bound to certain emotions for so many of us. I have been on this earth for a while now and have never had no emotional reaction to weather, and I mean just those that I am conscious of. Rumbling thunderstorm is heard on the inside during the raid on the bookkeeping front, and I just think to myself, good thing I don't have to be outside. Another important factor is the time of day. Most of the missions take place at night, in the early morning or late afternoon. This, apart from establishing the connection between lack of light and violent crimes, also creates an atmosphere of its own. Problem is, SWAT 4 has especially bad sky textures, outdated even in comparison to some of the games released the same year. Its night skies are somewhat betrayed by this, but the dawning burgundy sky that finds you in the courtyard of Fairfax residence is believable enough, otherwise you're mostly looking at smudges of black and dark grey. Here we get a dirty yellow sunset, but with patches of dark clouds carrying a lot of rain. You begin the entry in the old granite at 1812, and the rooms are well lit, but by the time you emerge on one of the open spaces, it's nighttime. It's just a nice illusion that implies a ticking internal clock. An urban setting offers a variety of lightning choices. Naked light bulbs, desk lamps, Chinese lanterns. In addition to these, there are other light sources such as freezers and signs machines with a light of their own. The game has a spectrum of visibility. There's complete darkness in which you need a flashlight, there's pure sunlight when visibility is at the highest, and then there are shadows in between. This is another example of how they've managed to create atmosphere out of mundane realism. In the software company, the working space is under a well-lit panel, but some cubicles are still unshadowed. It feels very natural to have these variations across a spectrum. In a few instances, lightning plays a crucial part in delivering a particular atmosphere of space blinds in the restaurant cutting into the light, TV static casting its flickering light onto a couch, a nightstand lamp without a shade, reflectors in the killing room, fallen lamp in one of the apartments, warmth of daylight in hotel rooms. These are moments where lightning either dominates the senses or amplifies the atmosphere. This is a gameplay game, but it doesn't neglect other aspects. Quite the contrary, it places sharp focus on them. This is why SWAT 4 isn't an ordinary tactical shooter. It pays as much attention to its atmosphere and setting as it does to its mechanics. There's a broader vision at work here. This version of New York, however detailed, ultimately comes to life thanks to its atmospheric soundscape. It's a part of the environment, of its atmosphere, of its storytelling. Environmental sounds greatly help maintain the immersion of a realistic world through their contextual presence. Lights buzz, water coolers, freezers, radiators, heaters, puddles, they all emit their own sounds. A particularly sly illusion is created through sound alone in two instances. As you push further into the A-Bomb Club, you hear screams and gunshots going off. They are muffled by walls, but still feel close. Nothing is happening, in fact, as both civilians and suspects have already been apprised of their roles, including the dead and the wounded. But in combination with the atmosphere, the illusion works. It is repeated again once you descend into the basement where illegal gambling is taking place. Previously contextualized disappearance of an undercover agent is further problematized through gunshots originating outside of your influence. Did they just find his wire and decided to deal with him on the spot? 
sound of weapons dropping onto various surfaces is important feedback, for example. That's a sound that signifies your success. This soundscape, together with voice acting, expressing NPCs' awareness and emotions, upholds the immersion of the situation. Wounded whimper, civilians protest, express gratitude or fear. Downed suspect sometimes utters a comment. I've conducted a small experiment with regards to the soundscape and I suggest you try it as well. Find a mission walkthrough without commentary and just listen to it without watching the video. It becomes obvious why sound alone carries so much of the experience. There's feedback for so many actions and scenarios that it reminds me of those old radio dramas. The sound of a doorknob on a locked door, grenade pin ejected with a metallic click, train passing at uneven intervals, confused civilians. What, what the hell is going on? Why are you doing this? Disgruntled suspects. Goddamn cops. Sniper reporting a sighting. I have an unknown in sight. Even without visual feedback, you still get the drama, suspense, emotions, a fateful report of what's happening at every corner. Soundtrack takes some cues from Heat with regards to how to merge action and anticipation of action with music. This leads to two very different types of soundtrack, dependent Don't on the context. The suspenseful ambient sounds follow your movement in anticipation of an event Shut that up. requires you your response. Live. It's the kind of music that puts me on the edge of my seat. In few instances, soundtrack is so integral to the location and its atmosphere that it feels as if the very walls emit it, trying to tell you something. It aims not just to follow your heartbeat in accordance with the mood of its environment, but to influence it. As it was the case in SWAT 3, each level's soundtrack has two parts, ambient and dynamic. Action is context dependent, ambient resumes again once things calm down. Sometimes the trigger for a more dynamic soundtrack is a specific action, like a grenade going off, but sometimes it's a particular room and crossing the doorstep results in a too jarring of a transition. Another limitation is that they've set a distance at which you can hear a particular environmental sound and if you cross that line you simply don't hear it even though you're not that far away. It's important to note that soundtrack and soundscape work pretty coherently in most situations such as Lawrence has basement, where the repetitive sound only heightens the effect of the music. Locks open, sir. Do it now! Oh, the hell with Hands this! Up. The classic definition of state is that it is a polity that maintains a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. In SWAT 4, you are that monopoly of violence. Its legitimacy depends on your decisions and actions. Right from the start, it is obvious that SWAT 4 is on an entirely different level when it comes to its shooting loop. It is a fact of life that those that have power have also the opportunity to misuse it. Being a cop itself leaves much room for criminality. But out of all moral questions that SWAT 4 poses, through its gameplay, misuse of power is not the one. You play as genuine good guys. That's the starting point. SWAT 3 had a special dimension, something most shooters don't have at all. Its own rules of engagement that place an emphasis on responsibility for every shot. SWAT 4 adopted those rules. What is a righteous kill and under whose jurisdiction does the answer fall? In this case, the jurisdiction falls with an internal objective arbitrator that manifests itself through a score or a fail state. But in addition to this, the game has a more immersive, diegetic system that's present within the world. This comes in the form of AI response. If you accidentally shoot one of your teammates, they issue a warning. If you continue, the whole team shoots back. It's rather rudimentary, but it does provide necessary feedback to your action and distinguishes a mistake from deliberate action. In addition to this, you have civilians shouting don't shoot and suspects saying I give up. There are several variations for when you shoot a suspect in the limb. Their body reacts to your violence. And even though your actions will be objectively judged, you can't play this game without having an internal judgment of your actions yourself. SWAT 4 is far from perfect in this regard. You can execute a cuffed suspect and still get away with just an unauthorized use of deadly force. Shooting cuffed suspects with less lethal isn't penalized, probably in order to avoid scoring negative points for accidents, even though it's obvious harassment. But what's important is is that it creates an atmosphere where you're expected to behave a certain way. That its execution has loopholes is something that can be fixed. You can make a mistake, of course, but any action that's obviously sadistic and wrong is so unimmersive by the standards set by the game that they are simply forced out of the game's context. You can turn this game into a psychopath simulator if you wish, but that would be like reading a book backwards. Nobody would deny that you're still reading that particular book, but you're engaging with it merely on the level of an object. Because of this, using 
a firearm requires more responsibility. The game simply expects a dose of seriousness from the player and counts on that internal sense of immersion. It is quite clearly stated from the very start that your priority is to avoid any civilian casualties and that the organized crime division is looking forward to chatting with Neil and Alex. The game is consistent in this regard and the context is always provided. You are penalized for the following actions. Shooting at suspects unaware of your presence because you have to give them a chance to surrender. Shooting at fleeing suspects since they aren't an immediate threat, even though technically you are no longer aware of their potentially dangerous location and they could be hiding behind a corridor with the barrel of their gun pointed at the height of an average male's head. You can't shoot surrendering suspects for obvious reasons, even though they might change their mind in the middle of it. In all of these scenarios, the game recognizes two categories of offense, unauthorized use of force and unauthorized use of deadly force. If they point the gun at you or any other person, the shooting is justified. The game is far from fair, which is the essential part of the experience. A suspect you've just spared because he wasn't an immediate threat at the time might kill your teammate without hesitation a minute later. A moment of hesitation can result in your teammate's or avatar's death. This is known to anyone who's played this game extensively, and this puts you on the edge. Difficulty as an element of the design isn't just a part of the world, but also a part of its moral principles. If such a scenario indeed happens, and it will undoubtedly, and then you start playing more aggressively, well, that's not exactly the right way to play the game either. Ultimately, you have to outsmart them. And that's the trick, because how you outsmart someone who's never in the same place and whose behavior to your presence varies. Both mechanics and aesthetics work towards creating an expectation. As less loss of life as possible. This system works because it creates a spectrum of possible approaches to violence, from going in less lethal only to killing armed suspects on sight. Even though I am perfectly aware of the great destructive potential of each suspect, I still actively aim to overpower them tactically and secure them, but I try to eliminate any potential threat if tactics fail. And I guess this falls somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. The point is, I don't go in with an intent to kill everyone with a gun, which I've never done prior to playing modern SWAT games, because this wasn't an option. And that's where SWAT 3 and 4 are an experience so removed from other shooters. What's important is that I don't do this merely because of a score, rather because I I accept the role and expectations set by the game, but they've made a bit of a mess here. The idea was to make an act of killing a human 3D model a bizarre experience. At the same time, suspects are programmed to be so ruthless sometimes that you don't always regret pulling the trigger a bit too fast. SWAT 4 is about using force and strategy to elicit compliance, not just kill. Justice is the ultimate goal. You are policing a city, not fighting the enemy. The game demands surgical precision from you in matters of life and death. It asks for engagement from the players, not just skill. But it isn't just about reaction times, it's about making decisions also. The game puts your whole performance into the spotlight, not just the sum of your binary decisions. Hardline, even though it had the option to arrest suspects, felt more like a war game. You would kill all these people and the game would just keep going. I find this power given to the player to be far more subversive than dual-wielded machine guns from Wolfenstein, because it feels like you're actually doing something rather than just killing, and you are responsible for the whole thing. It's far more satisfying when you elicit compliance from the suspect through planning and execution instead of killing them. It feels like a better job. At the same time, it's far more tense when you have other options besides killing because that creates contrast. You have the option here and that's the whole point. That's that stubbornly humanist aspect of SWAT 4 that few games have. By introducing a system that tracks the justifiability of each shot taken at a human being, it gives us a closer look at what a righteous kill is and it draws a line where there usually is nothing. SWAT 4 leaves us with a model of brutal crime and sophisticated, just and at times even sympathetic police, idealistic to the point of facing Kalashnikovs with beanbags. The connective tissue of SWAT 4 are its mechanics. Through them you interact with the space and the people, and through that interaction the themes of the game emerge. The core premise of SWAT is that there's a group of people held up inside an interior, with either hostages or their capacity for violence as leverage, while another group of people enters that space, using their own capacity for violence embodied in special equipment and tactics, to minimize or negate that leverage and resolve the conflict. The game symbolically calls this bringing order to chaos. This is never a large-scale conflict. 
the fact that this isn't a war setting but a city and that you are a SWAT team leader instead of a soldier makes all the difference mechanically. This is crucial for the unique experience that SWAT 4 ended up being. It had scaled down the scope of conflict which gave more room to not just very specific mechanics and deeper interaction with environment, but thematic exploration as well. SWAT 4 has two distinct approaches to missions, lethal and non-lethal. It's not a binary system but a spectrum. There are less lethal options for both the main and secondary slot. This makes a variety of approaches possible. You can make an entry without a single lethal option for you or your team. You can combine these options. And even if you go in with just regular weapons, you can still complete the mission without fatalities. In both instances, the goal is the same, to reach an all-clear status with minimum possible loss of life. Going back to the previous chapter, the game gives you a variety of options to follow its rules of engagement. It backs up its ethics with mechanics. Sometimes the less lethal option obviously does not fit the threat level. I I find the idea of using a pepper ball gun to face people armed with automatic weapons covered in Kevlar to be silly and in terms of immersion this doesn't work for me. That much benefit of the doubt I do not have. It's naively unrealistic to even consider the idea of facing criminals who have already executed hostages with anything else but extremely lethal options. The reason I'm mentioning this is that in all other aspects the game goes to great lengths to uphold its immersion and breaking this immersion for the sake of score or completionism on elite difficulty turns turns SWAT into a different kind of game for me. I always value experiences over challenges. If they can be integrated in an immersive way, that's great, but just working for a score feels too mechanical for me, like Pac-Man or Tetris with an atmospheric layout. They did make an oversight in relation to less lethal options. Using them in any capacity is beyond the rules of engagement. The consequence of this is that less lethal is counterintuitively superior to real guns, because you can just start blasting away as soon as you see a suspect. To the point that it feels like cheating the system. So by using a pepper spray or beanbags, you completely negate an entire aspect of the game, and quite an important one. However, this cheesing is harder to pull off when suspects wear armor and gas mask, because they lessen the effect. They also forgot to place any penalty to unauthorized killing by the snipers. The Elite Force mod expands upon the less lethal category so that there are penalties, and their unresponsible use can result in death or injury. For example, elderly civilians have a higher chance of dying from a heart attack if you use a taser on them. There are four types of ammunition, full metal jacket, hollow point, buckshot and slug. As a non-lethal option there's a taser cartridge, pepper balls and beanbags. There are factors that negate or lessen the effect of some ammo types and chemicals. Full metal jacket rounds have better penetration of armor and cover but can over penetrate and kill a civilian behind. Gas mask reduces the effect of pepper spray and annuls the effect of CS gas. You have to use either a flashbang, stinger or beanbags in that case. Flashbangs have a localized effect and put most of the suspects out of the aggressive mode, but its influence can be hindered by objects that block the line of sight. CS gas affects a larger area, passes through furniture, but doesn't affect those wearing gas masks. Stingers have a short range and don't penetrate cover, but pretty much guarantee surrender of anyone caught in the blast. A breaching shotgun doesn't pose any danger to nearby civilians, but it doesn't affect suspects as much. C4 is a bit slower, but it has an effect similar to a flashbang. It will, however, hurt those close to its blast. Lock picking is the slowest doesn't give out your presence, but neither does it have any effect. There are several actions and modes of fire, semi-automatic, fully automatic, two or three round bursts, pump action and an air gun based on compressed carbon dioxide. See how things start to complicate mechanically. You need information in order to bring the right tools to the job. SWAT 4 creates a lot of problems for the player, but it offers mechanics to deal with those problems. Out of this variation, several possible tactical approaches emerge two distinct modes of play that oscillate throughout the mission. Complexity doesn't come from just the fact that there are multiple categories, but from the fact that they cross over. Effectiveness of ammunition depends on the environment and suspect's equipment. The same goes for chemicals. Here's a possible scenario where rules of engagement in combination with mechanics create a complex problem. You use the OptiVand and notice a suspect wearing a gas mask, in which case you have to use either a flashbang or a stinger. You go in, the effect has taken place and the suspect is either blind 
blinded and choking or stunned. But his morale is still high enough despite your orders and he is not dropping his gun. Because of the gas mask, both the pepper spray and pepper gun are useless. You have to use either beanbags or a taser. If you don't have one equipped yourself, you must order a teammate to use it. This game places so much proactive responsibility on you. Thanks to these mechanics, force and violence are methodical, surgical even. This is in stark difference to Call of Duty 2 and Fear, both released the same year, and it's only somewhat similar to the Brothers in Arms games. One of the most immersive aspects of its mechanics is that they make Spot 4 a game of consequences. And there are consequences for almost all of your actions. If you want the highest level of precision, you can't use any other mode of fire except single shot. If you need more firepower, you must accept the recoil. Default movement is rather slow, but if you sprint, you risk revealing your position and your crosshairs expand significantly. Getting shot in one leg will slow you down and give you a limp. In both legs will disable the sprint option. Getting shot in hands will affect your aim. In larger levels this can be quite frustrating, affecting your state of mind and messing up your run. Stance, movement speed, mode of fire or recoil and subsystem damage if you are wounded are factors you have to take into account if you want precise shots. Aiming is almost a mini game here. You're given options, it's just that you have to mitigate their weaknesses and face their consequences. On top of all of this, the complexity of scenarios is increased as layouts offer more hiding places, more cover, less linearity and more interconnected rooms. But what is the point of all these technicalities in their methodical implementation? In Call of Duty 2, everything you do, everything that's available to you as a player role-playing a soldier, is to kill and destroy in order to defeat the enemy. In a broader context, you're making history by fighting Nazi Germany. In SWAT 4, you manage environments and enemy AI in order to resolve hostage situations and serve high-risk warrants. Mitigating human behavior in a violent situation is the end point of every mechanic. Every piece of equipment and every command are used to that end. Yelling at someone to drop the gun or firing beanbags at them are both there to secure compliance. You use the OptiVant to better assess the situation inside so that you can plan out your approach and make informed decisions for that same goal of managing human behavior. Whether somebody is going to drop their gun and surrender or keep fighting, that's the whole point of the game. The point of mechanics is that you're given a tactical advantage. Tactical, in my mind, is combat that focuses on the whole strategy, not just the shooting loop. Therefore, mechanics themselves urge you to play differently. Take the Optivant, for example. It's quite a different feeling barging into a room knowing exactly how many suspects and civilians there are, what equipment they have and where to focus. This is an advantage given to you by technology in order to perform the best job possible. This is of course subverted from time to time by objects blocking your line of sight, just to keep the tension. An important aspect of the game is that you don't have to do everything yourself. You can order your team to perform a variety of tasks instead of you. Surprisingly, commands aren't complicated at all. This is because of an intuitive solution to the command system. Instead of having a dedicated button for each command, they are all available within an expanding drop-down menu, through which you navigate with the motion of your mouse. There's a button for quick commands that is context-specific. If you aim at a door, default option is open and clear, or if you aim at a gun, default option is secure evidence. The same context-sensitive option is given for selecting equipment Aiming at a doorknob gives you an option to automatically select the multi-tool and proceed to use it with a single button. Left mouse button in that case serves as an action button. Thanks to this system, they've avoided the overly complicated and clunky controls that take you out of the experience. You use about as much keys as in a Call of Duty game, even though you interact with the environment and NPCs a lot more. You can split the team by pressing tab and issue commands through their camera feeds without having to stand next to them. This allows simultaneous entry from two sides. I was able to complete the quick store robbery just through giving commands through the camera feed while standing outside. For some reason there isn't an option for them to report back to talk, so once they do everything you have to go through the level and report every status. They've shot 4 out of 7 suspects, I've lost 1 officer, and the final score was 78. There weren't any penalties because their AI is programmed to always act according to the rules of engagement. The system works, but it is a bit clunky. Sometimes a gun you want them to pick up is right under their feet. And and the crosshair doesn't pick up the command prompt, or you don't see the door you want them to breach and you have to send them back until you get the line of sight. If you'd like to try it, just make sure both teams have everything to operate independently. Ultimately, SWAT 4 is a rather unconventional shooter, with a goal to fire as little shots as possible, with levels where you don't need to shoot at all. But I will fight.
In video games where the only interactive option is the kill, human psychology is mostly reduced to simplistic barks of defiance or hatred. Some games exhibit more nuance, such as rebels talking about you with fear in Far Cry 2, otherwise they just look for you and make threats. This is something we find even in the latest of video games, suspects without an implication that they are anything but code. In SWAT 4 there's a lot of interactions and responses from people and this adds an important layer to the overall fidelity of scenarios. Both suspects and civilians manifest a whole range of behaviors and emotions through animations and voice lines. They have hearing and sight. More importantly, they act upon them. They can hear your footsteps, sound of your tools or your voice. I run towards the door and a suspect in the room says, hear that. He's exhibiting spatial awareness and informing his buddy of his suspicion. And if you were in the middle of placing C4 charge on the door, you might have to adopt the new situation as they might come outside to check out the noise. Civilians can point out a suspect within their own line of sight and it feels dynamic and suspenseful as you are made aware of a threat that you don't see. There are animations for being shot but also for when a shot is fired near a civilian or a surrendered suspect. There are variations of them flinching and ducking down. That's fear and shock. Apart from just firing at you, suspects will run away, take cover, hide, fake surrender, threaten to execute civilians. That's a spectrum of behaviors that manifest inner worlds. This behavior is usually supported by a comment. In the final level, coming up to the cryogenics room, I see a suspect emerging from cover and going for the stairs. We all yell for him to drop his gun. He turns around and goes back beyond cover and doesn't attempt to shoot, like they usually do. It felt so flexible. The guy basically changed his mind after assessing the situation. It was as if he said, your move. This variety is present in civilian behavior as well. They can cheer the police on, express gratitude for their presence or protest the being cuffed. All of these are so understandable and natural that it almost feels like a simulation. Most interesting of variations is when someone refuses to comply. It's not that they are unresponsive to your comments, far from it. They clearly voice their protest and the animation communicates refusal and indignation. Suspects have several behavioral variables. Morale, aggression, threat status, awareness state, and a skill level. Running out of ammo and having to continue fighting with a sidearm lowers their morale. Same as being shot or seeing a body killed in front of them. This is an AI that implies psychology. The variety of it is best seen during the raid on the cult. Their lines and behavior manifest their state of mind and show the variety among them. Some give up immediately, some are resistant but non-violent, some fight until the end, but most of them express belief that Tyrone cannot be stopped. In the hospital level, the bodyguards of the South Korean diplomat will often fire at the element. They are on high alert due to the second assassination attempt and probably mistake you for the attackers. You do look similar. It's clear why these guys are shooting at you, but in this case it implies a different psychological state. Perhaps they're panicking and doing the same thing you do when you open fire on a suspect that was just about to surrender, even though he initially charged you. However fatal their mistake might be, it's understandable under the circumstances. But pain is by far the biggest factor in SWAT 4. In most video games, you don't have other leverage over opponents except rendering them dead. Here you have a group of people inside a room with different levels of morale, weapon types and gear. Your job is to subdue them through superior equipment and tactics. Their psychological and biological aspects are factors in this conflict. You can affect their eyes and lungs and exploit their tolerance to pain, leverage their surprise, their shock, even fear. Your purpose is to affect their morale, not kill them. In a game that relies so much on the use of various types of grenades and other less lethal tools, it's important to have realistic feedback for their effects. Less lethal options have four effects. Stun, blind, choke, shock. Coughing and expressions of pain sound genuine. There are animations for being tased, blinded, shot by beanbags or pepper balls. Without proper feedback, those tools would seem like magic. The implications here are clear. You can't blind someone who doesn't have a sight or shock someone that doesn't feel pain. Out of all possible variations in suspect's behavior, surrender is the most complex and implicative in my mind. There's a straightforward variation where they drop the gun as soon as ordered and drop to their knees. But there's two more variations. One where they raise their hands and then proceed to drop the gun. There's just a bit of a drag in the animation but not to the point that raises suspicion. The third variation is masterfully animated. They bring the gun to a level at which it is usually dropped and then the whole action just hangs there. Your entire ability to focus is drawn to that gun at that moment. From this point nothing is yet resolved. They can still drop the gun or start shooting at you. 
at which point your response times are challenged and that's a whole other story again. But this manifestation of hesitation, this implication of a mind that hesitates, is such a suspenseful moment that strains your nerves. What's going through his head? Is this the last stand or suicide by cop? However it resolves itself, you're left with that enigma. The capacity of suspects to experience fear, surprise, shock and pain is the leverage you have against them, a spectrum of determination that can be affected by your action. You are not fighting models of people wearing uniform, but organisms that can be affected by chemicals and blunt force, minds that can be surprised and shocked, like a game of chess with bullets and tear gas. This is revolutionary. Think of all those hundreds of video games where the enemy AI could be summarized with a sentence, they were brave and you killed them. They just come at you, yelling whatever generic bark fits their ideology and then they die and their body disappears. This also ties in with the ethics of SWAT 4 because NPCs are depicted as people capable of expressing these emotions, not robots with human faces. That's another reason to follow those rules of engagement. A game is changed radically when you don't have to kill everybody where there was only the possibility of death on both sides. Now there's a spectrum of human behavior. It isn't just a different experience in a mechanical sense, but a whole new psychological dimension of the human animal. Most tactical shooters don't have this option. In hundreds of games you come across people who you can only kill, or people who you cannot kill. No other possible interaction. Just think of the possibilities. Games depicting war would be transformed forever if such a system was to be introduced, where soldiers are capable of expressing emotions that affect their behavior. Behavior. Things like shell shock, fear, pain, that drive them to surrender or more radical action. And then instead of just leveraging them into non-existence with your bullets, you could affect their mind and their nervous system for different outcomes. Games have to progress in this direction because it feels so ingenuine to claim all this historical accuracy, realism or immersion that begins and ends with objects and architecture, but utterly fails to depict the complexities of the human mind in violent confrontations. Games have ignored psychology for too long. The rest of the content has to eventually follow the graphical updates. On the ground, now. I SWAT 4 is a game with no character development, no active arcs, no traditional story to tell, and yet it has a more profound use of the human voice than some narrative heavy games. Voice acting plays a central role in games such as Firewatch, Portal and Machine for Pigs. What's unusual here is that SWAT 4 is a shooter. Human voice is designed into the gameplay on a fundamental level. You cannot complete a mission without it. Firstly, because you use your avatar's voice to tell people to drop their guns and surrender. Secondly, because you have to report every status back to talk. You are the extended hand of the law and you must report everything back so that those outside, such as the emergency medical technicians, can prepare better. And it's not a one-way communication either. They respond to every report you make. A lead's voice and reporting to talk are two crucial mechanics. Beside them, there are voices of your team reporting suspect sightings, all clear confirmations and giving individual comments, as well as voices of the rest of the NPCs who can reveal information and provide feedback about their status. Lead's voice has a third role as well, which is to give out commands to your teammates. This isn't crucial because technically you can play the game solo. They've subverted one of the oldest tropes of first-person shooters, the silent protagonist. The avatar doesn't want to shut up here. From from the moment you select a mission, a voice is going to guide you through it, inform you, ask questions, respond. You will interact with people and your surroundings through that voice as much as any piece of equipment, sometimes more than the firearm itself. And that voice isn't going to be enough of an authority always. Far from being just informative and interactive, voice acting in this game is rather immersive. In my experience, this usually isn't the case. Will I ever see them again? My little ones? I must have faith. Bear with me now. In order for a writer and a voice actor to manifest their skill, gameplay usually has to be slowed down or stopped completely. That's why there are so often these distinct sections where there's a lot of dialogue. The talky bits. They usually stand in opposition to parts with action. In most games you have to drive a car or watch a cutscene to hear characters express themselves. In SWAT 4, voice is integrated into the gameplay on a fundamental level. It is an integral part of the game as much as setting and mechanics. There's a strong psychological dimension to voice acting. People sob, scream, stutter. But I, but, but I, I didn't do anything. Sir. Express confusion. I thought you guys were gonna rescue me. Rage. Why are you treating Move me over. like a criminal? Sense of urgency. They're trying Police, to kill me. Defiance. Out of my house, you they taunt you. My lawyer is about this. They sink. To the dirt. To the dirt. 
Commander's voice is stereotypically authoritative. Dispatcher's voice sounds authentic with that distinctive cadence. Sniper guys sound laconic and laid back at all times. 911 calls sound quite distraught. They properly portray the urgency of the situation to the point where a caller can't remember the exact address or almost gets into a fight with the dispatcher. Okay, I'm sending an ambulance, but if you could give me a street address, that'd help. What the hell? Are you putting me on hold? Is it this 911? I don't know the damn address! I'm right here, sir. Try to stay calm. During briefings, the commander, for the most part, maintains complete professionalism. He states the facts and points out goals without going into the underlying issue. However, he slips from time to time and makes a personal comment on the matter. The same is true of team members. Their communication is professional while reporting, but they make comments and offer worldviews in a more cordial manner off-radio. This creates a noticeable discrepancy between the technical vocabulary and a more relaxed expression between themselves. It's a human touch that adds another dimension to their personalities. Coroners probably joke about bad tattoos, it comes with the job. There are several instances of pre-scripted dialogue with talk where you report things of particular importance, discovering an unidentified victim in the basement, realizing the scope of civilian casualties at the A-bomb, discovering armed bombs at the old granite, or realizing that the amount of explosives at Tyrone's building is enough to blow up the whole neighborhood. They help create an illusion that situation is far more dynamic than it actually is. Upon your entry into the hospital, you realize that a new screw outside just gave up your entry. You inform talk and they say they'll cut the cables. Indeed, a few moments later the broadcast goes to static. There are some memorable voice acting performances here. Melinda Klein's mother pleading to her abductor, a cult member singing about the fate of their children. But the moment the operator on the radio is confused for a second as he processes what you've just told him is the most memorable part of the whole game for me. It is such a human moment. The robotic professionalism is overcome for a second. The game builds up to that point. The information over the radio was exchanged in the same restrained manner for several missions. And then this happens, naturally and understandably. A rule is broken so that you can have this profound moment. Doc, we found a graveyard in the basement. Looks like it's their children. Uh, copy that. Entry team notifying the morgue. Different design elements of SWAT 4 are consistent and coherent. Its UI elements are minimalistic and unobtrusive. Its controls organic and intuitive. Space around you is detailed and believable, as well as suspects and their motivations. People react to you according to their roles and psychological variety within the game. Their bodies respond to pain and chemicals used on them. Mechanics are realistic and have proper feedback and consequences. Interface, controls, mechanics, environments, AI, all work towards the same goal, that is to keep you inside the game's world. Immersion is a cumulative result of such a design. You have to move slowly. This is an experience with a distinct pace. Because of this, you're more aware of those detailed environments and more conscious of your actions. There is a distinct cycle of moment-to-moment -moment suspense building up into its resolution or escalation before the cycle begins anew. There are no checkpoints or saves. A level is a complete challenge. Once you start the mission, you are in there until its resolution. There are no mini-maps nor objective markers for guidance. It is as if you are there. Maps offered in the pause menu are rough guidelines in most of the missions. It's because of these unreliable blueprints that I've learned most layouts by heart. A lot like with the original Liberty City. The look of these maps is immersive itself. The rough layout of the A-bomb club, for example, is sketched on a piece of paper by an off-duty bartender. Sketch of the Fairfax residence was taken from a neighboring house, presuming it to be accurate for the first level. Video games as well as movies usually need slow motion in order to make you aware of the second and its passing, when they want to point out how much a single second can contain in terms of emotion and plot development. In SWAT 4, this comes as a consequence of its design. It creates scenarios that become archetypal throughout the game. Breaching the door, waiting for the grenade to go off, crossing through the doorframe. Time slows down in these moments as you await in suspense. Since you are coordinating the whole response, your actions have to be deliberate. You clear one room at a time, gathering as much information about it before you clear it. 
This requires active participation on the part of the player, and this takes time. It is another factor that firmly places you into the space as you have to gather information and make decisions. SWAT 4 has its own heartbeat. There is no slow motion breaching from modern warfare. Action is not choreographed into a feel-good moment. It's presented in its real-time rawness. Technically speaking, you can rush through its levels, but that's just a result of the flexibility of its design. Another aspect that draws you further into the world is reliance on sounds. You can clearly hear footsteps and doors opening and have to watch out for that. Layouts and suspects become more complex, leading to a wider variety of possible scenarios. The game remains dynamic throughout the playthrough. As you progress and learn, new problems are introduced. You go from facing a crook with a Beretta tucked in behind his shirt to militias wearing Kevlar. Suspects start carrying backup firearms and can reach for them in case they drop the main weapon. This is not a game you can play on reserve. Due to the randomized positioning and dynamic AI, the game always maintains a degree of unpredictability, even with all that tactical advantage. While its systems are mechanical and repetitive, the gameplay does not become robotic due to this unpredictability that keeps the suspense. HUD elements are minimalistic. The only information they didn't figure out how to relate to players diegetically were health status of particular parts of the body, ammo count of individual magazines, and mode of fire. Although subsystem damage is manifested diegetically through movement and affected accuracy. Apart from tear gas, all grenades can affect your avatar as well, including the pepper spray. Sting or flash effects are game stoppers, and you can't take that head turn for granted. It's something you have to practice diligently throughout the game, and you can't overcome it with a skill upgrade. SWAT 4 doesn't really follow the show don't tell principle, since it has a lot of exposition in its briefing sections, but it follows through on promises from the briefings in most cases, such as the psychotic behavior of Alice Jenkins. But a briefing will never disperse all the mystery, suspense or surprise. Mr. Park does not look like in the briefing photo because he's been attacked prior to his arrival at the hospital, where they've managed to treat him before the second attack began. The briefing before the Red Library mission mentions that the robbers had exchanged four hostages for two gas masks, which you find worn by suspects inside. Ultimately, different forms of immersion overlap quite effectively, mechanical, environmental, thematic. Once again, a lot of details support your immersion. As flashlight is attached to your firearm and not your helmet, you can't use it when cuffing someone or wedging a door. A lot of environmental objects are responsive to being shot. Some simply disappear, others have a broken state. Money disperses into the air, water sprinkles from a pipe, foam bursts from extinguishers. Bullets sound different based on the material they hit. Weapons have to be reloaded manually, and magazines are not discarded. Ammo is limited and not replenishable. This is not war and you can't use suspects' weapons because that's evidence. Since you depend a lot on your tools, their usage is fully animated. You use a one-hand opening multi-tool instead of the traditional butterfly version where the tools are collapsed around the pliers. A thumb pushing out the pliers is distinctly animated. He then turns the whole thing around and pulls out a lockpick out of the toolset. If you are disarming a bomb or disabling a wedge, the jaws of the pliers are animated. Display of the optivant is lifted up, pole is extended and you can see the protruding eye of the camera follow the direction of the mouse. This is true for the rest of the equipment. You see individual pieces of equipment selected for your team on their person. You can always check how much grenades are left, who has the optivand or the breaching shotgun. Comments and protests from civilians are contextualized. This lady asks about another employee. Is Kim all right? Robbers had to seek refuge in the Red Library after a car crash, and a confused employee asks, What do they want? Why would anyone take over this company? One of the suspects asks, who forget to pay the cops. This means that the operation has been maintained so far because somebody from the police was taking a cut. This is so much more than German soldiers yelling, Keeping in line with the presumption of innocence, even when holding an assault rifle in the middle of a hostage situation, armed NPCs are referred to as suspects. Following this line of thought, you have to restrain all civilians as well, since the role of each will be determined later by someone else, once order is brought to chaos. This is supported by the fact that in two instances, employees who look like civilians are actually in with the criminals and are armed. The game does not prevent you from accidentally or deliberately shooting your teammates, civilians, surrendering or cuffed suspects. 
Some developers take these options away, using the logic that it's unnecessary to leave an option for players to accidentally trigger a fail state. But by doing this, they remove a sense of danger. I believe that leaving these radical options possible and creating appropriate consequences for them is a much better option. Just to illustrate a principle, you can perform a suicide with the sniper. An utterly absurd act, but still possible. Furthermore, the nature of video games is such that it is harder to make an immersive experience from the perspective of law enforcement. If I occasionally run over a pedestrian in L.A. Noir, the textual punishment on the side of the screen is inconsequential. But I do have an internal flinch that I have to push aside with a rationalization that it was an accident caused by myself, by mistake, and not deliberately by Cole. And it would take a lot of time and resources to develop an in-game system where you running over a pedestrian doesn't result in a fail state, but instead a cop goes to trial. It would break the whole game down. It's hard to have realistic consequences if you have a story to tell outside of those consequences. This is a problem that's not easily solved in these types of games, and you usually end up with inconsequential penalties for serious actions. In Morrowind you could go to a prison for a crime, and the mechanic is pretty much the same in Red Dead 2 after 16 years, because it's hard to implement it even in a game where you are an outlaw. So, however unimmersive it is, I stop thinking about it and when Cole exits the car, I pretend he has no lives of innocent people on his consciousness. At least outside of World War II. Because what would be the alternative? Cole gets suspended, starts drinking, attempting to process what has happened. The whole thing becomes an entirely different game and then a couple of hours later you go back to the case you were working on. SWAT 4 somewhat overcomes this problem because it's much more confined and has a dedicated system that deals with these issues. You are given given a real capacity for violence and at the same time held accountable for it. Less effectively through score, but far more through the expectation and atmosphere built upon the realism and immersion. It's not like in the GTA 4 where there's a significant discrepancy between story and gameplay, but it's not ideal either because neither a score nor a fail state are particularly immersive. SWAT 4 shares its legacy with its predecessor, non-lethal approach, realistic urban CQB, and the concept of unauthorized force towards suspects were already there, and that's a game released in 99. What SWAT 4 did is brought that signature narrative into the space, and created more feedback for its ethical questions. In this regard, it remains without competition 16 years on. The series' option to not kill and still complete the mission is revolutionary, but remains largely ignored. There's also an absence of dedicated single-player campaigns, as if tactical shooters cannot tell stories. Insurgency, Arma, Tarkov, none of the modern tactical shooters have this. What's memorable about it, 16 years on, is that they've managed to insert strong narratives into this very procedural and methodical experience. It's a near-extinct concept, unless Ready or Not delivers on its promises. SWAT 4 is a brilliant cornerstone, but it's far from a definitive take. This status is largely artificial due to the absence of any real competition. In reality, the formula could be polished and upgraded to great lengths, especially in the field of enemy AI, making encounters and hostage situations more complicated and unpredictable. Imagine finding Fairfax on a toilet, in a bed, exiting a room as you handcuff his mother, or, God forbid, doing his work. The Stachkov Syndicate programmed the suspect AI that if left uncuffed and unsupervised, with a weapon near it, it would pick it up and continue fighting. Just this simple behavior changes the mechanics significantly, and this was already a feature in SWAT 3. Shootouts should be far more contextualized. Remember how a Korean diplomat is simply standing behind a morgue with his two bodyguards, while the attackers are spread out throughout the hospital, not actively searching for him. Suspects are rarely performing coordinated attacks. More dynamic scenarios would add depth and suspense. The situation inside, whatever it is, would seem alive. As it is, it feels like playing hide and seek. Clean House, although highly scripted and linear, offers some interesting scenarios. Suspects should shoot through walls, hide under beds, take hostages. In SWAT 3, they would even hide in cupboards. That's why I really look forward to Ready or Not as a spiritual successor to SWAT 4. From what was showcased so far, it will bring more physicality to the Avatar. That tactical feeling for gameplay with mag checking, modding weapons, modern warfare, styled reloads. The whole project seems like SWAT 5 in mechanical sense. It takes a lot of cues from modern tactical games, but there's that core SWAT 4 DNA in it. One element split into two teams, the same command system, the same tools and grenades. The inclusion of a tactical ladder and a ballistic shield has the potential to truly alter the gameplay, giving a whole new spectrum of creative options. Most importantly, Ready or Not seems to be following the most authentic aspect of SWAT 4 formula, a narrative woven into the mission through a dedicated 
single-player career. Unique, detailed and twisted facsimile of a modern United States. Ready or not's vision of America is downtrodden, cruel and corrupt. This is the part I am most interested in. One of the trailers shows subjects such as sex trafficking and school shootings. And that's a bar set high, even for an outsider developer. It also seems like levels are going to be quite atmospheric. Everything shown so far implies a creative vision behind the game, not just shallow imitation. The fact that there's so much hype about a spiritual successor to a 16-year-old game tells a lot about its impact. And that it's being discussed if it will get things right reveals how definitive SWAT 4 was in the first place. Thank you very much for your time. A special thanks goes to all of my Patreon supporters. I wish you all a nice day. Until next time.